Our uh, scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke. I'm going to talk about this a little bit in my sermon. It's an interesting thing about Advent when we talk about uh, the coming of Christ in lots of different ways, including when Christ will come again. Sometimes in the church we talk about that. And so some of the passages, traditionally in Advent, might seem a little out of place, but hang in there and we'll talk about it uh, in a second. So this comes from the Gospel of Luke. So hear these words. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth, distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then Jesus told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the leaves. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. And that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. This is the word of God for the people of God. So we are uh, coming into a season where we talk a lot about comfort. So comfort food, comfy clothes, uh, comfortable things that we watch on television. So let me throw, what's, throw, go ahead and call out, what is a comfy thing for you? And online, I would encourage you too, like on the chat section too, like when you think of comfort food, what's a comfort food? Turkey. Turkey. Mac and cheese. What was that one? Nutella. Nutella, all right. Bagels. Bagels. <laughs> Chocolate. Chocolate, all right. Does anybody have a comf- comfy clothes that you, you get into? Sweats, PJs, whatever it is. Fuzzy slippers, Fuzzy slippers. amen. Yes, so we're all comfortable. And you've got whatever it is, that movie that you watch this time of the year, you sit down in front of it. All of these things give us warm, fuzzy feelings. And all of this is understandable because we want to, in a sense, kind of escape, at least for a little while, all the things that are going on around us. We are coming up, friends, on two years of living into this very different way of life, and we're tired. On top of that, all the other things that we read about and watch, the injustices that we read or experience ourselves, and so for just a time, we want some comfort. And maybe, I realize not for everyone, but for some people, this is a comfortable time of the year, or something that makes them feel good. So you might, some people tell me, I come to church to find some of that comfort. And you might have come to church today and say, Advent, Christmas, this is a comfortable time, I'm coming in, and then you drop this Luke passage on me. And I'm like, wow, this is not a very comfortable passage. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. And you're flipping around the Bible and say, where's the baby Jesus in all of this? Is it possible, when we read this passage today, is it possible to find, as the Christmas song tells us, to find tidings of comfort and joy, even in the midst of this passage, and even in the midst of the weariness, the anxiety, and the chaos that we might be feeling right now? Is that possible? Well, we'd like to hope so and think so. Part of our sermon series that we are talking about over the next few weeks is A Weary World Rejoices from the line in O Holy Night. Is it possible that a weary world can indeed rejoice? I hope so. 
So as we've noted today, it is the first Sunday of Advent, which is Advent is short for Adventus. Drop that little nugget of information on coworkers or friends and family this week, which means coming or arrival. Now normally, this time of the year, of course, when we talk about the coming of Jesus, we talk about the birth of Christ. We decorate our homes around that whole notion. But also, historically in the church, they have talked about different kinds of coming. So we talk about Christ has come in the birth. Christ is coming, meaning we know and experience the presence of Christ here and now, today. And we say Christ will come again. That in the church, historically, we've talked about and believe that Christ will come and make all things new. Heaven and earth will kiss, and that will be the day that salvation is known for all. So in Advent, we talk about all three of these things, and that might be a little bit new for you. Some of you today, when you're coming, again, if you're kind of new to church and you hear things like this passage or you hear things about the second coming of Christ, it might remind you a little bit of that relative at Thanksgiving who says these slightly off-the-wall things, and everybody just kind of nods and says, we're just going to leave that relative alone. Or I also know some of you are coming out of traditions where it seems like that's all you ever talked about, was the coming of Christ again. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Repent, and then they encourage you, maybe demand of you to take on lifestyles that don't seem like they fit exactly for you, and you come out of church not with joy, but instead with fear. So I know that we are coming to this passage in lots of different ways, but we hope, and I think, that we can see in this passage, actually, that in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the uncertainty, we can see Christ's presence very closely. Jesus kind of intimates this. So again, this is verses 31 through 33. Jesus says, So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Jesus seems to be saying, not just one day, but also here and now, when we sense that chaos, that fear, that distress, that all of these things are taking place, that's when God is closest. That may seem counterintuitive. But perhaps we can think of times in our lives, not always, I know, some people continue to lament and wonder, where are you, God, in the midst of the weariness? Where are you in the midst of the chaos? And we wait, and we wait, and we wait. But I hope that we can also think of times when it's in those moments when we sense God's presence most closely. And also hear the words of Jesus, who says, heaven and earth will pass away My words will not pass away. When everything seems to be off kilter, when nothing seems to be going right, when we cannot wake up and go on another Zoom meeting yet again, we remember that Christ's words will not pass away. In those moments, that's when the kingdom of God is near, if we are aware of it and if we can be alert to it. And it's in this time of the year when we particularly try to encourage one another to be alert to Christ's presence, even in the midst of the chaos. I've seen this recently a couple of ways from the world of art. Some of you know that I see a spiritual director, and I went to see her a few weeks ago, and I told her, I said, I feel like I'm in kind of a rut spiritually. Have any of you ever felt like you're in a rut spiritually, and you're wondering, how do I get out of this rut So we talked about some of the practices that I do in reading scripture and prayer. And then uh, she asked me if I uh, had ever done something similar to Lectio Divina. Some of you may have heard of Lectio Divina. It's a way of reading scripture where we pay attention to words or phrases that seem to jump out at us and we hold those in our hearts. She encouraged me to use instead pieces of art and to look at these pieces of art, or listen to these pieces of art, and pay attention to images, not just words. So perhaps, and you may have, hopefully you've got something in your bulletin today, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but maybe that is something, if the words just don't seem to be doing it for you right now, that we can listen and gaze at something else, where we can see God's presence 
in the midst of it. So the first example from the world of art is from a song called Mary Had a Baby. I'm leading a Tuesday night study in Advent starting on uh, this Tuesday, where we look at African-American spirituals that are connected to Advent and Christmas. And the first one that we're looking at this week is the song, Mary Had a Baby. Is anyone familiar with this uh, hymn or song? Rico, would you mind just playing kind of a verse of it? Let's try this. The lyrics are Mary had a baby, yes, Lord. Mary had a baby, yes, Lord. Mary had a baby, yes, my Lord. Let's sing that together. Mary had a baby, yes, Lord. Mary had a baby, yes, my Lord. Mary had a baby, yes, Lord. People, people coming and the train. I didn't give you that last line because in some when you look this up online, sometimes that last line is left out, but it's a key line. The last line is, the people keep a-coming and the train done gone. The people keep a-coming and the train done gone. And some of the research from the book that we're using by Carolyn Kirk Dugan and Marilyn E. Thornton, they asked the question, what does this line mean? The people keep a-coming and the train done gone. On the one hand, it could mean a spiritual warning. Here's a quote from the book that said, Mary's baby represents freedom, salvation, and deliverance. Oh, my Lord, do not miss your opportunity to worship him. But it could have a different meaning as well. It could be a reality check. Again, from the book, it said, On many plantations, Christmas was the one time of the year in which everyone was allowed to relax, making it a better time to escape from enslavement. Don't be too late. You don't want the train, the conductor, to be gone by the time you get there. And then from the book, the authors said this, awe in this song, awe and wonder are side by side with reality. Awe and wonder are side by side with reality. For those singing this song, their reality was enslavement. Their reality was murder. Their reality was rape. And yet awe and wonder still existed And yet they continued to sing. Even in the midst of their lives, falling apart in ways that we could never imagine, still they sang and sensed God's presence in the midst of it, knowing that Jesus' words would not pass away. The second piece of art, and this is what you have in your bulletin today, and we'll also put this up uh, up on the screen as well. This is from Vincent van Gogh. It may be familiar to you. You may have seen it before. It's from the uh, Metropolitan um, Museum of Art in New York. Beautiful painting. I don't know if you know the story behind it. Van Gogh painted this in the years, months between 1889 and 1890 when he was at St. Paul de Mossal Asylum in southern France. You may know he struggled with mental illness for many years of his life. And he went into this location for those who were struggling with this. And he looked out of his window, and this is what he saw, and this is how he painted. In the midst of all that he was going through, you may notice at the front of the painting there, that is a cypress tree, which is associated with graveyards and mourning. But also, in the middle there, you can see there is a church. Van Gogh's father was a pastor. And so maybe at the center of it, somehow, some way, he knew that God's presence was still in the midst of the swirling all around. As you look at this piece of art, and we hear again the first verse of this passage, there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. 
I don't know if Van Gogh was thinking of this verse as he painted this, but how this comes through when we read about what Jesus said. Even in the midst of all of the swirling things that were going on in Van Gogh's life, as we look at this painting and see all of that, and yet there are still points of light evident. Still there is beauty even in the midst of all the struggles that he was going through. Awe and wonder were side by side with his reality. They were not mutually exclusive. This passage may tell us that when reality, the realities that you and I sometimes experience, when reality is drenched in weariness or injustice or anxiety or depression, perhaps those are the moments when the kingdom of God is particularly near. This is not to say that we simply throw up our hands and say, I'm just going to leave it all up to Jesus. We are also called to live into this reality so that others can also experience that nearness of God. One scholar I read this week said that when he reads this passage, he says, I see Jesus making a case about the fragility of life and the fierce need for people of faith to show up each day with stamina and courage. We are all experiencing weariness. We are all experiencing perhaps the chaos of what Jesus hints at and also what we might see in this painting. But in the midst of that, can we have also the opportunity to sense that the kingdom of God might be still near? That we still might have time for tidings of comfort and joy? that awe and wonder can indeed be standing beside and enter into our reality, as challenging as that may be. I know it can be hard so often in these times for us, but I hope and pray, and I hope you join me in this time of Advent when we pray for Christ's coming, the Christ who came, the Christ who who will come again, but also the Christ who is here now. We pray that that incoming would break into our lives so that in the weariness, we know those tidings of comfort and joy and peace. Let's pray. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for the ways that you lift us up, that you enter into our lives. And we pray, especially in those moments when we are feeling most lost, most wayward, most weary, most anxious, we pray that you would be most near then. Come into our lives. Help us know of your presence so that we might be your presence to others. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.